Welcome to the Pine Talk, Episode 9. Take a look at your clock, your pine time, and pour a glass of wine, because, knock knock, who's there? Gnu. Gnu who? Gnu no who? I am Peter, just a family guy. And I am Ezra, content creator who forgets to create content. I'm working on it. I'm available on YouTube and Odyssey under the name Electronion Links in the description to both our channels. And welcome to the ninth episode of Pine Talk, the podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. In this episode, we'll be discussing two conferences that recently happened, the May Pine64 community update, some more community news, as well as going through some of your questions and feedback. But first, what have we been up to lately? I'm still working on my point-and-click adventure game. It's going uh, forward. <laughs> I'm having actually a lot of hard time with it, but uh, I'm hoping that I can release it for... Well, I'm going to release it June 22nd, no matter what happens. So I just want to get as much things done with that. On, on, on something more relevant, uh, you mentioned uh, that, yeah, two conferences happened. I participated in one of them. Uh, I was virtually at the Linux App Summit. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't there for the entire thing. It spanned three days. So, but I, I saw a few of the talks, and they were really interesting. And we'll talk about that uh, later. What about you, Peter? What have you been up to? Well, I was quite busy with visiting family, so I uh, didn't manage to attend any conferences, sadly. But I've tried to follow up since. Mm -hmm. And I've only managed to post uh, my weekly updates called Linbits on linmob.net, the weekly update about all things Linux phones, and uh, to post uh, the past progress of Linmob apps and um, a glimpse in the future of what I call linuxphoneapps.org, uh, which also is now on Twitter, at linuxphoneapp. Do follow if you like. Uh, and yeah, so I've written up something, um, but I need more input and I linked some uh, pads in the post uh, that I made, but they didn't get much love yet. So um, if you have any feedback, uh, maybe contribute there or send me an email, get in touch on social media. Um, that would be nice. Or, and even if there's nothing and you think, well, that's all perfect, what you're thinking about, that's going to work like this, uh, tell me that, because that would, would help too. But enough about me and my stupid projects, uh, let's get to it now and deal with a new segment we've introduced, and that is app of the episode. So yeah, somehow more of the same, right? Mm. And my first pick... And the pick for this episode would be Agrigore Browser. Agrigore Browser is a minimal web browser for the distributed web, based on Electron and thus on Chromium. It supports protocols like the Hypercore protocol, among others. And while I really don't have any experience and only little knowledge about this, it's cool to have done something like this on the Pine phone now. We'll also link a talk by the project's author, Ranger Morph, about Agrigore browser that should explain why this is great, better than I ever could. Oh, awesome. I can't wait to, uh, to see it myself. Yeah, and speaking of apps, <laughs> let's talk about what you have been experiencing at the Linux App Summit. Yes, so it was a... Uh, it was, uh, very interesting. Uh, first thing I can tell you that I experienced is that uh, a lot of people could benefit from a better microphone. <laughs> that that aside, uh, there was a lot of, of valuable information that was uh, spread and things that I can benefit from. The various things I I, uh, I heard at the Linux Up Summit, um, creating a community. Uh, they were talking. Uh, I forget who exactly. I should have probably wrote that down. But in general, there was a group of people talking about uh, how to start a community uh, in the open source or FOSS world, free and open source software world. 
Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. They mentioned to not make another distribution or a package manager. Like, (laughs) you know, we have enough of those and uh, they work very well. So it might be better to contribute to existing ones than to just create your own. I mean, of course, create one if you want to, but, you know, don't necessarily expect uh, to to stand out if you're not doing anything different. If you're just another package manager, you know, doing nothing different, uh, you need to solve a unique problem, big or small. If you have a passion, others will follow. You can start a community by picking up an old or dead project and give it new life, kind of like what UB Ports did to Ubuntu Touch, right? So you don't have to start from zero. You can pick up a project that others just are like, you know, if you find something old and you're like, oh, nobody's contributed to this for like months or years and, and you're like, well, I think it's interesting and it's outdated now, but, you know, you update it, you make sure it's all good and new and you start a whole new thing with it. And, you know, you're not alone. Other people are going to share in those problems. Um, Picking up the pace here, um, there's forcing hardware vendors to care about Linux since 2015 by Richard uh, Hughes, uh, which uh, I had. This was the more uh, technical of the talks that I uh, partaked in that I listened to. Uh, I didn't understand everything that he was saying, but for the most part, (laughs) he was talking about firmware and how, you know, a lot of times if you wanted to update the firmware of certain uh, things, that it would require some Windows executable or some thing that you just couldn't run on Linux or, or, or something like that. And so he, he wanted to find a way to get people to care about or he was showing how to get people, companies, to care about supporting Linux. And he did so by, instead of just complaining to the company and being like, oh, well, you should like totally support Linux because we're important too, uh, you have to go out of your way and build an ecosystem. Show, uh, like, like make something that's actually useful, like a free product uh, of sorts. Uh, he talked about the importance of being installed by default. So, like, you can imagine, like, uh, a lot of people use the default web browser on their computer because uh, it's installed, right? So, you don't, you don't have to, it it could be more important to aim for that kind of a goal. Uh, You want to build something that solves a problem that's a lot like the community thing. And I think that just goes for anything, you know, if you're not doing anything useful. (laughs) But, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was, uh. Interesting to, to 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 see how he was talking about um, mm. a kind of indirect way to get people to care about Linux. Yeah, I just looked him up. I think he's one of the people that definitely are involved with, and maybe he was even um, involved with starting the firmware update project. Well, thank you, Richard. We we appreciate your uh, your efforts and your knowledge that you get to now share. So I definitely have to listen to his talk again to to fully understand it yeah that stuff is quite intense (laughs) Mm -hmm. like i i have another point here where he was mentioning that you need to to create things that are designed not to be cloned but uh like i have nothing to say about it because i didn't understand (laughs) so i just feel a bit like an idiot but i'll listen to it again it seemed really interesting um the next talk uh w- that i uh that i have listed here is adaptive apps the future is mm-hmm. now by uh tobias bernard uh he talked about uh, gdk4 and uh, all the awesome things that gdk4 does i love gdk4 <laughs> it's gonna be so cool and anyway he talks about uh like the like i i just like his I don't know the way he was talking about it. He he made it seem so so GDK four and, and the dynamic apps, adaptive apps, right? The, the idea that you literally have the same app on your desktop as on your phone, line per line. It's not a port. It's literally the same app, and it just adapts to whatever screen resolution you have. I think is really useful, and it's even useful on a desktop because like if you want to like 
make your app a, a super small square in the corner of your screen, well, it'll still yeah. be usable, right? So I thought it was really cool. And that's pretty much what he, he talks about. He talks about GDK4 and the new things it can do. It can do 3D transforms. So kind of like on the web with CSS, a 3D transform. And he uh, showcased it by showing this uh, 3D FPS kind of uh, a demo where you could walk around uh, some 3D environment that was built out of uh, various icons. I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, that's uh, cool. He showcased nifty effects that you can do now. You can click on the light and dark theme and there's a little effect that uh, I think he said he thinks it's made with shaders. But uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of sweet animations and widget logic so that things can be stacked differently depending on the adaptive nature. So maybe you have three hor- three bars next to each other, but when it's compressed, they'll be th- over each other. Anyway. It, it, yeah, pretty it's cool. cool. And finally, the one I was actually looking the most forward to is um, funding Krita. As soon as I I, um, I saw that in the um, schedule for the Linux App Summit, it was like the one I wanted to see because I'm always curious on how these software stay afloat. You know, are they doing it all for free or do they uh, actually, you know, get paid doing it? And Krita obviously uh, gets paid doing it, and they have uh, enough money to support multiple uh, developers, which is really nice. And the talk by uh, Hala Remt, if I'm saying that correctly, um, was super insightful, very enlightening, absolutely inspiring. He talked about how multiple times they used Kickstarter and how a lot of their Kickstarter clicks, like, People going to their Kickstarter came from YouTube, uh, which was uh, interesting. They talked about how Krita is available on Steam for a price, which I think was very interesting because I had a similar idea myself. But with like open source games, uh, that you know, mm-hmm. you can obviously like compile and ship your game with Steam and use Steam's stuff, but like have a free version that doesn't rely on steam on the side too, or just have the source code available. Like, and like, it's a hassle to compile things sometimes. So what you're really selling is the work of compiling it. Right. So they, they had a few issues with it not being up to date, but when it is Mm -hmm. up to date, it works, you know, flawlessly. And they also put it on other things too. Uh, that will, they, they talk about the whole story behind it, but put simply, they also put it on the, windows store uh which um as much as people say it's dead uh still is raking them in uh, a decent amount of of cash flow uh which is always fantastic yeah. and Even it's just... a tiny fraction of uh, the giant windows install base uses that store and buys creta there exactly that's yeah. a lot of money yeah yeah for an open source project 100 percent for sure for sure otherwise they try to include um they they do fundraisers and accept donations of course like most other projects but it's really interesting and cool to see what they do they say that they were inspired uh by blender for a few of the things they've done and i i definitely think more projects should uh try to experiment and see how else they can um make money it's it's always very interesting to see and you're not really i don't think you're l- losing by trying you're spending a bit of time but i think it's it's really good he said also the importance of having a a um an accountant so <laughs> uh that's uh also yeah. something to note so yeah in conclusion uh all the talks were very very uh informative right so you know you don't have to watch all of them i didn't i i i uh i didn't have time and also wasn't necessarily interested in everything that was said said but that's just me so like find find some things that that you think are interesting like the adaptive apps or or how krita makes money and, and listen to it i think it's it's worth your time to uh to hear what they have to say and these are like you know the the big players so to say you know yeah 
they, they know they know they've been around they've been around the block so see what you can learn from them i enjoyed i enjoyed my time and it was really cool and uh i'm happy everybody who uh sponsored the event uh did <laughs> which includes pine 64 <laughs> yeah great i think we'll link uh the re- the schedule of the conference and the talks uh the recordings of the talks you talked about and maybe mm-hmm. the general uh youtube channel mm-hmm. in our show notes and so that people can follow up on this awesome good so i will talk about the other conference that took place the same weekend and that is uh alpine conf it's the first ever alpine conf and it was of course a virtual event as you may know, PostMarketOS is based on Alpine Linux, and thus there were th- three amazing talks by members of the PostMarketOS community on various topics, which you should all watch as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, the first one is uh, by Oliver Th- Smith. That's uh, Oli Paranoid, the guy who initiated p- the PostMarketOS project about PM Bootstrap, the Swiss army knife of PostMarketOS development. Uh, I think I talked about PM Bootstrap a bit in a previous episode, and I think it's, while it doesn't adhere to the Unix philosophy, arguably, uh, is an amazing tool, because it can do so much, you know, like build packages and so on. So watch that talk. It's about an hour long and still totally worth it. Then uh, something that maybe less exciting to some of you because if you have a pine phone uh, you may know some of this but still a good wrap up by martin bram a showing of post market OS, where he shows the various user interfaces on multiple devices and then another one by the sxmo uh, people on simple x mobile a minimalist environment for linux smartphones And that one really blew my mind, Uh, a great demo, and they were so good at using it, you know. I'll never get that good at using SXMO, honestly. Um, But yeah, uh, we'll have links to the recordings, including the big blue button room recordings, uh, which contains the Q&As and the conference itself in the show notes. Oh, I, de- I definitely have to check that out. Yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <I will>. <laughs> now, <laughs> the community update. Yes. Title, Connection Established. So, Ezra, why don't you start with the yes. Pine Time news? The Pine Time. There's a big interest in the Pine Time following 1.0, uh, the launch blog. More Pine Times will be available in June and will feature Infinite Time 1.0 installed by default. Uh, uh, many pull requests are waiting to be merged. Uh, there's a new version of Siglo and improvements to Pine Time support in Gadget Bridge. And uh, you, the, this was like right before we started recording uh, yeah. Siglo. Uh, just released a new update and you tried it out peter yeah i did and um, it's uh, has quite some improvements to the ui so it's definitely quite a bit better now not that it was bad before but you know there's good and there's better and this is better i think so i think looks yeah, like I, some of these pull requests have been merged and released <laughs> <laughs> i think i think siglo uh it has uh, has an excellent uh, how to say development flow uh, like as you say like siglo works and worked before and, and that's what's most important and all these new fancy icons have not deteriorated that experience if anything it's made it better and that's exactly I think what an update should do <laughs> definitely so, good job sigla yeah by the way, I think Martin Bram was involved in that too. So <laughs> it's always the same names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So 
let's go over to the pine phone so the big news that well maybe will take some pressure of you is that rolling production of the pine phone started so the idea is that you can order it any day or any month this year and they will be shipped out once a month roughly Mm -hmm. so you can just order them and they will be available so it's not like it was before like oh they're all sold out now and then i saw these people on twitter that were like oh my god sold out when will will they be back (laughs) and then pine the pine phone was briefly back with the next community edition Mm -hmm. and then was gone again Mm -hmm. so that's uh, apparently not supposed to happen again uh, also, um, on tangential note, um, Lukas wrote a blog post, uh, guest post on linuxsmartphones.com. In Linux smartphones, we trust. Um, you should read that, maybe. It's quite an interesting read. Uh, then let's go to the uh, accessories. There's a close look at the PinePhone keyboard internals uh, in this uh, update and they are now having internal review in units uh, and some have been shipped out to developers uh martin bram again has shared some impressions on youtube <laughs> so watch that video um we won't summarize it because well it's just a short video just watch it and you'll see something that's maybe more helpful than Uh, listening to me rambling on about this. Uh, It will be shipped to uh, us not mere mortals uh, later this summer. Before that, wireless charging and LoRa back cases for the PinePhone will be available in June. Um, Then Megapixels 1.0 got a well-deserved mention, but we talked about that in the last episode already and the pine phone <laughs> firmware work is progressing uh including work on voice over lte uh but a little more on that later maybe so now the pinebook pro the uh, fedora 34 in manjaro with uh gnome uh for the bp P. Uh, that's hard to say. P B P. I'm just gonna say the Pinebook Pro. So yeah, Fedora 34 and Majora with GNOME are now available for the Pinebook Pro. Uh, so we will have uh, links to that in the show notes. Um, Peter is looking forward to trying Fedora on his yes! Rock Pro 64. I am. It's gonna be cool. I, I run Fedora on everything that I use so far, so it's gonna be cool to have it on a. On yet another device, the Rock Pro. Yeah, and on ARM. I mean, I don't think I'm running... I have run Fedora on... Well, I've run it on my Pine phone, but, you know, on, on another ARM device yet. Mm. So I'm looking Good. forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing stuff about it from you. Um, the production of the Pinebook Pro has been placed on halt due to component shortages. Uh, Pine64 will keep you updated if you want a Pinebook Pro. Now is the time to pick one up. Uh, we'll, I guess, talk about it maybe next episode too to tell you if you guys already bought everything, <laughs> which you probably would have. Yeah, maybe. So it's it's really uh, there's no production plan for the foreseeable future, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, if you want one, get one now. Sad. But, Sad. Uh, that's this component shortage. It's bad. I gotta see if I can get one. But still, some new proje- products get launched. Uh, and uh, one of these is the Quad 64. New hardware revisions are with developers currently. And unless something unforeseen happens, they will be available to developers in the Pine Store in June. So, regarding the general uh, 
story of further shipments in large quantities well yeah supply chain difficulties exist and while a single board computer is certainly easier than a notebook or a tablet uh yeah it's all difficult in 2021 on the software side for the quad 64 there has been a lot of software progress regarding enabling the rk 3566 chipset in linux uh, many pitches have been submitted and some have already been accepted continuing with new stuff um LoRaWAN is a big topic lately in the Pine64 community and the PineDO, that's the official name for the for the Pine64 LoRa project, is expected to launch next month, including gateways and endnotes. So there's uh, going to be those uh boxes right mm -hmm. <laughs> the pindio if you go on the wiki page there's uh the lora gateway which is uh, going to be available in indoor and outdoor variants it's basically uh pine 60 a64 lts you know so that og board basically in its current iteration and uh rak 2020 uh, no 2287 module which is the Laurel Barn part, and that also has a GPS. RAK Wireless is uh, kind of important, and Pine64 announced a partnership with them um, in between the publication and production of our past episodes. So, yeah, we're really looking forward to that, and um, connections have been made already, and I think that's where the title of this community update uh, comes from so right but we have a few opinions on uh, on Laura Wan that uh, we should share right we should I guess I'll go first um, low bandwidth high range simple to understand hard to master there's about as much things that you can do with this technology as things you can't. I see potential in the Internet of Things world, long-range smart devices that can just sit out in the wild with nothing but a battery pack, like truly random sensors just dotted around the world, drip-feeding data to their respective gateways. I imagine, for instance, a small battery-powered device with solar panels that would sit in the wild and Maybe you take a picture of anything that moved. And when it takes a picture, you could send it over Lorwan to the best available gateway to which, through internet, would end up to my machine, saving a copy. If my maths aren't mistaken, mistaken uh, the best case scenario, it would be that uh, it would take about 10 seconds or so at uh, 50 kilobits per second for mm -hmm. a 640 by 480 JPEG that's about 56.3 kilobytes. Or in the worst case scenario, it should take approximately 2.6 days at 2 kilobits <laughs> per second. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it's not a good idea, but it is possible. And sure, you're clogging up the network a little bit, but I mean, who's going to get mad for that? But, you know... If, if you have small amount of data, like let's say, I don't know, you wanted to analyze the entire uh, virility of an entire forest ground, then I suppose you could dot a matrix of sensors and just, uh, you know, send like just just small amounts of bytes of data, just small bits. Um, but yeah, hopefully I haven't made any mistakes in my math for, for, for that. But uh, long story short... I'd love to experiment with it myself, physically. It sounds nifty. What about you, Peter? What do you think? Yeah, like you just explained, uh, I think it's exciting. Uh, and, yeah, it's really low bandwidth. This is something we have to remember. So applications are necessarily limited and need to be cleverly engineered around this limitation. like 
compressing on the node before it sends it out. Stuff like that. So personally, this limitation, as someone who likes the efficiency of all the computer software, seemingly had when they did much we do today with way less CPU cycles and memory, think word processing, RC, and plain text email, makes me like this technology. So in a way, for me, that long bandwidth is what makes it exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you really need to be a bit smart. Yeah, to to use this for more than just IoT, but even with IoT, you need to make sure that you are clever with how you send your data, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, one hundred percent. And speaking of limited technology being exciting. Did you install that uh, custom firmware into, uh, into your modem? Yeah. I think you managed to get that with absolutely no issues whatsoever. Ah, uh, well, I I did it. Uh, I did it before recording. Uh, you know, I was slacking off because I didn't want to prepare the show. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to get this done to finally talk about it. And mm. the thing is, like this, I can't talk much about how well it works i can tell it works so i've received a call since and i could uh call my other phone you know <laughs> stuff like that but uh i will talk a bit about the process of installing it because i had a hard time doing this you know because at first i did not bother to set up minicom correctly and without having adb set up uh, you can read Maggie's website for how to do that. And good luck following his instructions. I'm not smart enough to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to use Minicom to send your phone's Quackthal modem into fastboard mode, which you need to do in order to refresh it, because you refresh it like an Android phone via fastboot. Um, I used a Manjaro Plasma Mobile dev belt from SD card to do this. And um, Fastboot is part of the Android Tools package. Minicom is just Minicom. So you need those two installed. And you need to download, of course, the package.targz from Victor GJ's <laughs> repository of the release section. And uh, yeah, I then disabled a phone service to make sure that the modem wasn't busy. Mm-hmm. So to configure Min- Minicom, I followed a guide on blo- bloggerbus.ca. So another fellow Canadian, maybe you know that person as well. <laughs> <laughs> Canada is a small country, right? Oh no, not small, just sparsely inhi- inhibited. <laughs> um, yeah. I had to go with the device name uh, TTY USB 2 instead of TTY USB 0 and so on. Um, there was no prompt or anything in Minicom, so I figured, oh god, maybe it didn't work again. But then I realized I could type, uh, so I typed AT at first and then it gave positive response and then I typed AT plus Q fast boot. And guess what? The Minicom connection stopped working soon after. But then I realized that the modem had switched into fast boot mode. And after that, I was able to follow the further instructions on the release page of Victor GJ's uh, project. And yeah, I had to use the fast boot flash raw command for one part where that's an option in this description. But yeah, this is all quite complicated. So I think I'll write a blog post on the topic and if i manage to do this so before the release of this episode you'll find it linked in the show notes of the episode so by the way if you're watching this podcast as a video on youtube odyssey or tilvitz make sure to head over to pine64.org slash pine talk for the full show notes they should be linked in the description of the video watching too by the way just a quick reminder and now let's come to community engagement <laughs> yeah, and listener questions. So our first question is by Blort, a friendly name in the community. Yeah. Blort, Blort. at 
Technics.de yeah. on uh, Tilvids. He says, uh, now I really want to try Minecraft or Almond slash Ada uh, on my PinePhone or rather on my server with the PinePhone as a client. P.S. When are you going uh, or when are we going to hear slash see more about the p- hashtag PineCube hashtag PineTalk? Well, uh, personally, sadly, I didn't have much time for for playing with the Pine Cube because I was so busy on testing uh, Linux smartphone apps and I was traveling and all that. Yeah. So yeah, I I hope to get something done, but I can't promise to be able to say much more than this <laughs> before yeah. the nap- next episode is going to be recorded. Yeah, sadly, I didn't. E- I didn't use. I didn't use the Pine Cube that much either because of reasons and excuses. But I will. <laughs> I do plan on, on trying it uh, shortly, as soon as I can get my hands on a on a on a SD card. Uh, since I only own two, it'd be nice to own a few more, and uh, I can plop one in and try experimenting a little more. I want SD cards. That's my excuse. Anyway. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm going to try it out, and I have uh, Peter to help me, you see? Because he's already gotten up and working. I literally never booted the machine. <laughs> so, I didn't so, do much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's an absolute pro, and you should ask him all your questions. Anyway, uh, I do know that... Um, yeah, so to answer your question, it'd be we'd probably talk about it uh, in the next episode. Anyway, I, I'll I'll do everything in my power to to get mine up and running within the, the next two weeks, so that I can talk about it and experiment with it and do things with it. And uh, also, your little idea about um, running Minecraft Minecraft on a on a server that your Pine phone connects to, I think that's an absolutely uh, fantastic idea. I really feel the power of your own central us network of awesomeness you know be your own google (laughs) spy on yourself (laughs) hashtag be your own google (laughs) (laughs) yeah but that's great i really look forward to you experimenting with the pine cube yeah i i think it's gonna be i think i think it'll be cool i'll try stuff yeah awesome Good, so next one um, by Race Cake on YouTube. Have you guys thought about verified boot camp on PinePhone? I think this means just verified boot because boot camp is a Mac thing only, as far as I know. So, yeah, I, I put it into a search engine and I came up with the story for verified boot from ROM to user space on ARM. It's from 2017 and then there's this core boot and head stuff that some laptops have implemented. Uh, But seriously, I don't know much about this and I don't even know whether the all winner A64 ship in the PinePhone has the necessary prerequisites to do this in a good way Mm -hmm. so it's definitely something to look into and if you're listening to this and you've experimented with verified boot on your pine phone please tell us about this and we're going to share your awesome story heck yeah or your sad fail (laughs) <laughs> that's if awesome. you feel like sharing I mean, it. that can happen right when you try stuff you end up failing yeah uh, our next question is by intra on youtube yeah do either of you have your own channels that you post on well, we've had similar questions on about that topic we've talked about in the youtube comments show notes on pine64.org should be linked in the video's description but my stuff is simple to find it's all on linmob.net that's l-i-n-m-o-b dot (laughs) n-e-t and i am elatronion that's 
E L A T R O N I O N everywhere. <laughs> so simple. So simple. I can't even believe people can't find me. <laughs> you know. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's one more, but I forgot to paste it in. But <laughs> we will answer it anyway, and we won't edit this out because, well, it's fun. Yeah. Isn't it? Super. And that question was, how about a FM radio back cover by Dion Dennis mm. on YouTube? What do you think, Ashla? How about an FM radio back cover for the Pine Phone? Would that even be possible? I feel like you'd have a higher bandwidth than uh, than a Laura Wine back cover. I mean, <laughs> who would want that? Yeah. Uh, question is, I to C uh, has the I to C buzz enough bandwidth for that? I don't know. I really don't know. Hmm, that's a good question. How much does FM radio even need? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. Uh, we, maybe there's even FM radio hardware already in the phone, but it's not used. Yeah. Some. Simple dumb phones had FM radio back in the day, so I think uh, it yeah. might be a feature that could already be in the Quackle modem. But yeah, hmm. we would have to look that up. Hmm. Uh, I did a quick search for it, but didn't find anything. But I think a more the road search might lead to more. So if you know more about this, then uh, please again. Tell us about your awesome findings. Um, I know that some people used SDRs like these, um, uh, I think, Realtek SDR dongles on their Pine phones connected via USB mm -hmm. to do stuff like FM radio, but an FM radio back cover would be uh, some something different, I think. Yeah. And <laughs> basically just, uh, yeah connecting a TV stick, TV <laughs> USB dongle, uh, wire USB, and then gluing it to the cover. So it should be something simpler. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's not even necessary because the modem could the theoretically do that. Yeah. But then, of course, you would need an antenna and that might require extra wiring. So we don't know. It could be fun, and a back will, cover with uh, a wire. I will personally look into this <laughs> if nobody gets in touch and we will report on this next episode. Awesome. If you are subscribed to our MP3 feed, check out the chapter markers. These can be handy if you vaguely remember something we may have talked about or said and you want to find it again. Um, or if you want to find a segment or no, if you find a segment really boring and you can just, you know, skip over it. Like my beautiful poems. Yeah. Or, well, who would skip those poems? I know, Seriously. nobody would. Everybody would want to skip two my poems. <laughs> yeah. That's Another it. the first thing. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. That's odd. But maybe they can skip back and then re-listen. Yeah. Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, if you don't need these chapter markers... Save them bandwidth and use my beloved Opus version, the only version of a, this podcast that could possibly be sent over to Orban in a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Once more, a huge thanks to Nerdsum Media for being our awesome audio producers. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks. Remember? This is a community podcast, so please leave feedback on what we should do better. Get your suggestions in and feel free to ask questions. We're really close to running out of questions again. Uh, we have some left, but some of them require a full episode to answer them. So um, if you have little things you'd like to know about or just know our opinion on, please do ask them. You can join the Discord channel, Pine Talk Dash Podcast, on Pine 64's Discord, obviously. You can send us an email at pinetalk at pine64.org and tweet at us. We're 
at TalkPine. We're also available on Mastodon. We're at TalkPine at Fostodon.org. If you can't remember these names, just use the hashtag AskPineTalk. That's a good idea. Please do that. <laughs> and last minute spoilers. We will have another interview in the next episode, so you've got something to look forward to. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. So have a great time, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>